Shalom, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Beit Tehillah Community Podcast. We believe the Torah is relevant for our lives today, God's teachings and instructions. You may very well be part of the first generation to be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and have the Torah, a Christian with Torah. Join us as we honor the living God through the study of His Word, topical conversations, and interviews with special guests. Please welcome our hosts, Pastor Nick Plummer and Ryan Cabrera. Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Beit Tehila Community Podcast. I'm your co-host, Ryan Cabrera, and I'm in the beautiful Studio B here oh, with yeah. Pastor Nick Plummer. How long has it been? It's been a while. Since Over you and a month. I, Since you and I have... Oh, man, are you kidding? It's been like six or eight weeks, probably eight weeks, since we've sat at this table together. That's a long time. It's been too long. We had the feast days. And now we're like, reunited. I think I only did two feast days. so good. I didn't get to do tabernacles. Well, we had or Ro- Matthew. We had Rosh Hashanah. We had Yom Kippur. We had tabernacles. But I didn't do tabernacles. And the eighth grade day. Yeah, we didn't do the eighth grade day as a podcast. No, we didn't. No, we, we, we had, well, listen, I was in the land of Israel for five weeks. That's Praise right. God. What an awesome, blessed trip Words we had. Words describe that. I should do a, a podcast just with Ashley and I at some point just to talk about, you know. I would. What the lessons are that came out of that. But um, but we'll see. I don't I don't even know. You know what I mean? I got five weeks worth of stories. That'd be like a 10-hour podcast, you know. So <laughs> it might uh, it might be tough. Um but we're having we're we're now in that time period after the fall feasts, right? We had a blessed tabernacles here as a congregation. I'm praying that you guys had a blessed tabernacle season, uh, season of Sukkot, right? Uh, the Lord definitely was present um, with us, uh, and now we're looking towards the end of the Gregorian year. We're looking towards uh, Hanukkah, right? What are you dedicated we're to? We're doing this podcast on the day of the election in Israel. For a new prime That's minister. right. Today there's elections. For parliament. That's right. It's already evening. And then a over week there. from today is our midterms for America. Yeah, a lot of good stuff. It's coming up. So yeah, that's right. I voted yesterday. I voted. I got. I had took the test and I got all the right answers. You know. <laughs> yeah, you did. So, <laughs> so uh, I also want to mention. So uh, one of the things that uh, we do every year. Uh, or we've been trying to do every year, and this year it seems like there's a lot more people that are just dialed into it and dedicated. This is, is true. Is the Daily Bread Journal. Daily so Bread I, Journal. So that's what I have, the regular brown one, and then I have what they're considering the ladies' edition, although there's not technically like a men's and women's edition, but it's, you know, as you can see, this one's prettier, and as ladies are prettier than men, you know, there's a, a different cover on it. But those are the two ones you can get for this year. It starts with the... Uh, um, the beginning of the new tour cycle, right? That's so you, right. So you Genesis. finish Deuteronomy... Start with Genesis. We're already, uh, what, two and a half weeks in. Um, so I think that if you want one of these, you can go to arielmedia.com and you can order them there. Or you can call our office, 813-654-2222, and you can pick one of these up. Um, but it's awesome. Uh, what a blessing it is to go through. You get uh, to read the whole Bible, right, in a year. And if you do the little extra bit, you get to do the whole Bible and the New Testament twice. Right. Um, and the... Uh, the, there's prayers in there. There's little commentaries in there a little bit, uh, but mainly it's a reading plan and a journal, and it just puts you uh, in a way that instead of having to read, say, the tour portion all at once, it splits it up every day a little by little and then gives you a portion from the writings, from the prophets, and from the Brit Hadashar, the New Testament as well. So I encourage you guys. I think these are like 30 bucks right now. Get it because they're going to run out of supplies and get it because it's it's time sensitive you know you can really start any time but it's nice to start at the beginning of a tour cycle catch your way in there and all that so what are we doing this week we're doing what matthew we're back in matthew and we're going to do chapter 20 verses 1 through 19 today and this is uh, the parable of the vineyard laborers it gets pretty interesting in here wow yeah, we're going to jump right in here. We got Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 9, the parable of the vineyard laborers. You want to read those first nine verses? I can. The parable of the vineyard laborers. All right, so this is in the New King James, and it says, uh, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, 
Why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give, uh, give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they received a denarius. So let's set the precedent here, right? Mm. You want to go ahead and lay a little foundation for like what happened before with the rich man well, and I just, Peter. First off, I want so to say jump in here. I want to say this story is not fair. <laughs> okay, I don't. This is you know obviously one person works one hour and they get the same wage as a person that works for twelve hours. Right. Doesn't it doesn't sound fair? We got to get like what is it? OSHA or There's something wh- going whatever on government agency on this guy, you know, because uh, that's what they would do. They, they would come after the kingdom of God with all they got because a bunch of godless agencies. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. <laughs> so it's important to recognize that chapter 20 uh, is a continuation of chapter 19. Right. right. And we have the situation where in chapter 19, and it's been eight weeks, which is why I'm going to go through this context, uh, is the story of the rich young ruler. So the rich young ruler comes to Yeshua and asks him, how do I inherit eternal life? And Yeshua tells right. him, keep the commandments, do all these things, right? Sabbath, feast days, whatever. And, uh, or it's, it's not murder, don't commit adultery, all that, right? Honor your father and mother. And obviously the rich young ruler is like, well, uh, I'm a Jew, right? I've been doing this my whole life. You know, I've always done this. And he says, oh, okay, well, wait, guess what? There's one more thing. He says, sell everything that you have, right? And follow me. Give it to the poor yeah. and follow me. But the rich young ruler goes away sad because he had many great possessions. Right. So he's very rich. and He wasn't wanting to give that up. And he didn't want to give it up. So while this is going down, the disciples are all kind of witness to this interaction between Yeshua and the rich young ruler. And so Yeshua comes and says, hey, assuredly I say to you that the kingdom of heaven is like a rich man, right? I'm sorry, the kingdom of heaven that is, I'm sorry, that it is more difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven right. than it is for a camel to fit through the eye of right. a needle. Right. And then the disciples were like, OK, well, that's that's rough. Right. Because we all want to be rich someday. Right. <laughs> right. And uh, and so mm-hmm. then he they say, well, who then can be saved? And he says, well, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So for those of you out there that were worried about being rich, it's possible for the rich man to be saved. That's true. All right. So we keep going on. And now Peter has cued into something because he's heard what is going on here. There's like a little reward going on or whatever. We're trying to figure out how does this treasure thing work, right? And Peter says, hey, see that we have left everything and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? Like, what do we get? Right. And so Yeshua answers him this way. He says this in verse 28. He says, assuredly, I say to you, that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And then in verse 29, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. (coughs) So we take the first will be last, the last will be first context here, and it seems very obvious, right? When you put yourself last and you put the kingdom first, God will then elevate you because of what you have invested in the kingdom, right? So it's an investment system. Invest in the kingdom, and you'll receive a hundredfold uh, return. That seems like a pretty good deal. Would you think that's a good deal? I think so. It does. And then we get to chapter 20, and we get a little... We yeah. get a little wonky here. For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And, of course, grapes were one of ancient Israel's most important crops. And thus Israel was of uh, ten referred to as the vine or vineyard of God. You can find this in Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 7, Jeremiah 2, 21, and Hosea 10, 11. So uh, Israel was uh, often referred to as the vine or vineyard once again. So... It's very interesting. And so then what is the vineyard then? The vineyard here in this scenario represents what? Israel. I mean, Or represents the activity. It, it, it can be, yeah. So the activity Cause, of the kingdom. Because the vine, the branches, he's trying to in connect everything. Right. Where the branches, he's, you know. But he's sending these, these laborers into the vineyard to do the work of the kingdom 
right? So the vineyard is where the work of the kingdom is being done in this world. And even more so, if we want to jump ahead a little bit, the vineyard represents the activity of the kingdom in this world. Matthew chapter 21 coming up uh, after yeah. he enters Jerusalem, verses 28 to 46. Roger that. So he likens the activity of the kingdom of this world to a vineyard. So there's something going on with the vineyard, you know, uh, a reap what you sow, a return. Well, and these laborers the are working for the landowner, and the landowner here is obviously the head of the kingdom, which would be Yeshua. So then they're working for him. They're doing the work of the kingdom. And, of course, uh, and when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard, Matthew 20, verse 2. So he said, I'll give you a penny. Yeah. Right? Uh, Now, the word penny is used as the Latin word denarius for a Roman silver coin in New Testament times. It took its name from it being equal to 10 donkeys, which is interesting. A number after 217 B.C. increased to 16. So interesting commentary to go back and look at or whatever. Here's a penny. Go get 16 donkeys. Yeah. I have a penny. For one penny, I can get 16 donkeys. We have 32 that's, donkeys. That's the commentary. Us. So I have to kind of go back over that because I don't know if I can believe every commentary. Or, I don't even know if I understand but, what it means. But a denarius was a typical day's wage for a laborer. I don't think you can buy 16 donkeys for a day's wage even back then. Interesting. I just don't. I don't think they're that prolific. I don't think but you we'll can have to go back and, and look supply at supply and demand. The, uh, just tells me that's wages. not true. I know it's just it's the commentary. I just thought it was interesting. <laughs> Whether we believe it or not, we have well, to study it. It right? might have gotten its name from that. And if two hundred years had gone by, maybe it was inflation, right? So back then, maybe sixteen donkeys could give you a denarius, but maybe back then a denarius wasn't a day's wage. And right. then two hundred years later, a denarius is a day's wage. You can't get sixteen donkeys for that. Another anymore. thing that's interesting is grapes are a symbol of Ephraim. Ah, that's true. You know, we've got a little uh, a little banner here in uh, the sanctuary that says double portion of Ephraim, you know, and it has the two grapes. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, bunches of grapes hanging but off of it. But Ephraim, uh, and we could get into the whole vineyard thing and the grapes of wrath. Ooh. The vintage. Stamp them out. The wine press. Oof. You know, like the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Yeah. Where you crush the grapes and yeah. the blood Where the, of the grapes, grapes of wrath like, were stored. Yeah. With the grace of wrath are stored. Yeah. Um, moving on. Matthew chapter 20, verses 3 and 4. And he went out about the third hour, which is 9 a.m., and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. So they're going to work from like 9 to 6. That's nine hours, not 12. Right. Well, but it's interesting that it says, whatsoever is right, I will give you. So he doesn't even promise them. This is right. An he, actual wage. He doesn't, give, he doesn't do that. The work day was typically divided into four three-hour increments, running from approximately 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Yeah. Because from three to six is the fourth watch. So think about it. Roger that. Um, moving on. Matthew chapter 20, verses 5 through 7. Again, he went out about the sixth hour, which is 12 p.m., and the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, 5 p.m., he went out and found others standing idle, saith unto them, you know, why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, go you also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So here's some more idle people working some different hours from 12 or in the sixth hour, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. is six hours. The ninth hour is 3 p.m. to, of course, uh, 5 p.m. That's only two hours, the 11th hour. So a, a different set of hours. There's like 12 hours. You might have only worked one hour, the 11th hour to the 12th hour, right? Um. Or and whatever is right, point. that shall you receive. You know, I mean, and that's kind of interesting. Um, the eleventh hour, five p.m., was near the end of the workday. These workers are desperate enough to continue waiting for work. Each of them received a denarius or a penny. A penny, yeah, a penny. The, the penny, yeah, the penny. I think a denarius is more than a penny. We'll see. <laughs> Matthew Just chapter twenty, verses eight and nine. That's right. It's a day's wage. You're into commerce. I am. Yes. So when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, 
beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. They worked an hour. Mm -hmm. And they got the same that worked for 12 hours. So you got any thought on that before we read? Some I more? think it's not fair. I think that it's not fair. I think it's not fair. I'm not going to protest it, right? But I think that it needs to be, the point needs to be made that it's not fair. The, <coughs> the point is that it's not, it's not fair, right? Um, at least from our Western wage for hire by the right. hour mindset, right? Yeah. Because we're going to get into why you can flip the script and say it is fair. We're going to get into that. Yeah, we are. Right? But if we're just looking at this as, you know, just apples to apples, just reading the story on face value, it doesn't, it doesn't really seem So fair. he goes into the marketplace. He gets the laborers. And now we're gonna, I'm going to read Matthew chapter 20, verses 10 through 16. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto thee, or I will... I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first shall be, or the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. So, so the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. Or actually you can say, but many choose. So, but when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more in verse 10 and 11, 11. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house. Hey, they got, I worked 12 hours and I got a penny. You, this guy works an hour and you give him a penny. But the word murmured is the Greek word gaguzu. And it means to grumble. That's the word murmured in the Greek. Gaguzu, and it means to grumble. Uh, the word good man is the Greek word aika despitus. And it means the head of a family, householder, and master of the house. Ica despitus. The word good man. It sounds like a, a disease. Word. Ica despitus. <laughs> and it means the head of a family, householder, and master of the house. Saying these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. Verse 12. Matthew sounds 12. like they agree with me. They don't think it's fair. It's not fair. They don't think it's fair. The laborers who were hired early in the morning thought that their wages would be greater than those who only worked for one hour because they labored longer. So let's stop there. Yeah. I notice something here. The workers that worked 12 hours didn't come to the landowner and say, the guys that worked one hour should get less than us. What they said is that we should get more than them. Right. Right. So it's, it's, it's a distinction here because they had already agreed for a denarius. Right. They thought it was fine to work for a denarius. 12 hours, I'm going to get a den denarius. Right. They were like, hey, I'm glad I got hired. Right. I mean, I think at the beginning of the day, you start out that way. But then the end of the day comes and the guy that works one hour gets the same as you and now you're, you're miffed. Right. But it's only because oh, yeah. of that comparison. That's true. Between you and them. Which is quite evident. So I just want to make that, that little point there and then we'll, we'll extrapolate on that maybe after you finish the verse. Yeah, Matthew 20, um, verse 13. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? See? I mean, think about that. They did. They, the original workers at the beginning, they were hired for a wage. They negotiated, right? I guess right. in that, I imagine. That was that first group. And that was that first group, and they hired. The 12-hour group. Yep. Verses uh, 14 and 15 of Matthew 20. Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? In the uh, English Standard Version, Matthew chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. Here's, here's the, what, the, what the landowner is saying. Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? 
or do you begrudge my generosity? Wow. That's powerful. I mean, that's his role. Right. It, it, well, it's his prerogative. It's, it's his money. So it kind of reminds me of a thought just came to me. I remember when I first got saved and everything, and I was reading in Romans, I believe it is. It says that God shows mercy to whom he wants to show mercy to. I think it was referencing Moses and the people of Israel. So along yeah. those lines, you know, I thought I said to myself, well, he showed me mercy. He didn't have to. No. But he did. Right. So that's something to think about, and his mercies are, are new every day. Now, the landowner addresses the worker gently, explaining the fairness of his actions. The laborer failed to be thankful for his own wage because he was blinded by his self-interested lack of compassion for his fellow worker. Right. So instead of just being happy for the, the workers that got hired later in the day, he was comparing what they got to what he got, and then he was unhappy with what he got which if he would have never known he probably would have been perfectly happy receiving his day's wage and going on but it was known oh, but it was it was known. evident you know uh, verse 16 of matthew 20 so the last shall be first and the first last for many be called but few chosen this parable is not about monetary rewards for working hard but about god's favor freely given to all it is a strong teaching about grace god's generosity don't begrudge those who turn to God in the last moments of life. Yeah. Because in reality, no one deserves eternal life. It's, it's like the thief on the cross, you know. It was over. Right. He had done the deal, done the deed, and he decides, I'm going to believe. And Jesus says, you're going to be with me in paradise. Yeah. Should have went to hell. Matter of fact, Barabbas should have been the one hanging on that cross. He wouldn't have helped those two thieves. No. If he it was wouldn't. Barabbas. He would not have. So think about, once again, here's God on a cross. Looking at the thief on the cross, you're going to be with me in paradise. You believe. Wow. Well, and, and I don't think when we put it in that context, I don't think any Christian looks at the person that uh, believes right at the end of their life on their deathbed and receives eternal life. I don't think they look at that person begrudgingly when you put it in that context. right? Because it's, it's not a wage, right? This is, this is not necessarily... Uh, a peer group or, or whatever. You don't see it that way. However, I do remember a story of, um, was it Joyce Meyer? My wife was mentioning this, uh, that her father had abused her, her biological father, and he received the Lord on his deathbed because of her. And you can kind of feel a little bit funny about that. Maybe it's this person who sinned against you or now, hurt you. That, that's an interesting And now story. that person is receiving the reward. You know what I mean? So there's, there's more scenarios where I think if you put it into other contexts that people can, can begrudge someone receiving salvation for eternity because it's for eternity, right? And that gift doesn't get revoked. So, so now, now we've come all the way through this parable. And the point, if we go back and we look at what happens with Peter, where Peter clearly gets a promise that because of what he has done for the Lord, right. the extra things, the leaving everything behind and following Yeshua, that he gets a big reward. He gets to sit on a throne and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. That's a big promise, right? And then God, Jesus even promises everyone else, hey, those of you that gave up things for my <laughs> name's sake, guess what? There's a reward for you, a hundredfold, right? A hundredfold reward. So then when we come into this parable and we see that everybody gets the same thing for the day's wage, it makes you wonder, right? But I guess... Because wages were established for the first set of laborers, but not for the second. Right, he didn't establish any wage for the rest no, of them. No, he didn't. But here's then the question. Eternal life is eternal life. You don't get more eternal than eternity, <laughs> right? So if the wage here is eternal life, then, then that's right. it, right? And the other piece of this is that God gives favor and mercy, as you mentioned, to whom he will give favor, and it's not fair. Why does God give favor to this person over this person or to that person, right? It's all in our perception of what we're seeing. We don't see with the eternal eyes yet. So we're seeing things happen in this life and wondering, well, why does this person get this favor and this person doesn't? Why, why, why the differentiation? Why the distinction? And the answer is, because God can do whatever he wants to do to whoever he wants to do whatever, whenever he wants to do it, right? Um, there's a sovereignty piece here. But then we finally come to the end, and again he repeats, so the last will be first and the first last. Those that were last. Now, I don't really understand. 
Now, let me read this commentary because yeah. I thought this was kind of interesting. Good. Let's hear it. This makes much sense. A lot of sense. Check this out. Those who agree to earn one denarian for 12 hours of work set their own price for their work, and that is what they received. The Lord wants his servants, Christians, to follow the example of the other workers. Those who serve the Lord and leave the size of the reward up to him will always be given far more than if they insist on knowing how much they will receive before they begin. That's an interesting point. I know, I know. That's an interesting point. So you're meriting something. You're you're valuing it. It is significant that Jesus did not refer to the hired man as a dear friend, which would have been in, indicated by Philos. Instead, he called him heteros, which is used to describe a comrade or acquaintance. Jesus called Judas heteros. Mm. <laughs> In Gethsemane, just before he was arrested. Uh, so there isn't like this personal relationship. Sure. Or, you know. Yeah. So the word friend is not used. It's like an acquaintance. Hmm. Maybe it's, uh, well, Lord, if you'll do this for me, then I'll believe. And you set the price. Okay, well, you did this for me. And I don't so, know. I don't know. So then we have this one last mysterious sentence in the last verse. For many are called, but few chosen. What? <laughs> but, many, but few choose. So I've heard it said that way, that many are called, but few choose. I've heard that. I've also seen it in uh, the God's Not Dead, one of the iterations of it in the movie. He's in jury duty or whatever. And he talks about how it's like jury duty. Many are called, right? 300 people get called up for jury duty, but only 12 are chosen. You know? But I, don't, I just don't see how that makes sense in this kingdom example. I'm trying, I'm trying to put it into... A context that It's makes like, sense. you know, so when are we going to choose? So if I look back on the times that people were trying to reach me as a Catholic to be born again and lead me to Christ, to get me saved or born again, and I was Catholic and I pushed them away. But you were called but not chosen. Yeah, that, at, that at that point, point I didn't choose. Right. I didn't choose. Right. But when I look back on it now, it was, it was an opportunity that I could have chosen. Sure. But for whatever reason, I wasn't in the right state of mind or the right timing or whatever. And I appreciated their, you know, Thought. their concern yeah, towards me sure. or whatever in that regard. But I was Catholic, so I just kind of pushed it away. One of them was an assistant store manager of a grocery store. Huh. He gave me a nice little promise book for like my birthday or something. He gave me this Michael W. Smith cassette. Cassette? Yeah, it was a cassette. <laughs> That's cute. And um, and I listened to it and everything. I thought, oh, that's interesting, you know. Christ yeah. Christian music, I guess. I don't know, you know. Because I like the 80s. But, you know, uh, I look back on it now and I was thinking, wow, you know what? He was trying to reach me. Yeah, he was. And this other guy, Robert. Trying to help you find his your name was Terry place Boyd. in this I'll never forget, world. Because <laughs> I want to thank God for planting the seed, but his Amen. name was Terry Boyd. And this other guy, Robert, was trying to lead me to the Lord as well. Yeah. Because I could see he, there was something different about him. Sure. But it wasn't enough for me to make that, you know, that switch or that change, you know. Yeah. They were very ethical and moral and no cursing. And so I thought, you know, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I understand what you mean. So the few being chosen or the few choosing, I think that's a good point. I think many are called. God has put out the invitation to the whole world. But how many choose, right? And how many are willing to go and wait for the vineyard owner to call them, you know what I mean, to come in? Very um, interesting. It you is. Know? Especially when you look at the harvest of, of the vineyards. It's the conclusion of the ages. Yeah. So why don't you go ahead and uh, Yeshua will rise from the dead. Read Matthew 20, verses 17 and 19. So this is interesting. Matthew throws this kind of in the middle of some stuff here. And I think it's because they traveled now, right? He's getting ready to go into Jerusalem. It, exactly. Chapter, so. Exactly. So now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them. So he takes a little, little side note, right? He says, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will contemn, condemn him to death. And deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. Wow. So I, I just find it, like I said, interesting that he pulls them aside on the way up to Jerusalem. Right. Matthew just throws this one little excerpt in here because it's, you know, right. 
it's literally he pulls him to the side and says, hey, I need to tell you this. And, uh, and he goes, so it says here um, that this is the third of four predictions of Yeshua's arrest and crucifixion. So the reference to Jerusalem, the religious leaders, and the Gentiles heightens the drama. So he's added some, some details here that weren't added before. For the first time in the narrative, Yeshua gives additional clues about his betrayal and who will carry out his arrest and crucifixion. So the arrest comes by the religious leaders, but the crucifixion is obviously going to come by the Gentiles, the Romans. Um, and uh, why do you think... <coughs> why do you think... Um, Yeshua would share about his, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection with his disciples? Well, I'm going to go with because of unmet expectations. Huh. So you think he was trying to prevent unmet expectations? Because of unmet expectations, meaning that... Um, they're looking for this king to come and rule and reign and beat out the Romans and all that. So he wants to set the record straight. I've come to, to do this. Yeah. To get them thinking, what? Oh, okay, for my sins or whatever. But they think it was like a mosaic of all these prophecies that you have to put together. That's why the enemy couldn't figure it out. Sure. But because of unmet expectations, um, Yeshua told the truth of why he came uh, to set them up. They didn't understand it but they were told. And then it goes back to say they reflected on what he had said and right. they realized, yeah, he's supposed to die on the cross, not rule and reign. Right, right, right. right. So because of unmet expectation, that's what I see. Interesting. I think also so that they would know that it was the plan of God when it happened, right? Um, that you know, they, he's foretelling the events. So when it happens, it shouldn't be a surprise. And that's kind of like what all prophecy is to us, right? God's given us the answers to the test, so when it does happen, we know that God's hand is on it. Right. And that we don't have to have fear because we know that this is the way things were supposed to go because this is the way he said it would go. Right. I think that's a, a big piece. Um, and so that's the end. I mean, that's that's chapter 20, verses 1 through 19, Pastor Nick. Whew. There's a lot to that. Well, I think that this is a profound thing. I think it's it's actually, it's simple, but profound. The whole concept here of the first will be last and the last will be first. And that those that show up at the end are going to get eternal life. Right. That God has made it so that you don't have to be an Orthodox Jew for your entire life. Right. And keep all the prayers and the commandments and all this in order to receive eternal life. But that, that there is an opportunity for everyone. That the, Good the, point. The, 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 the opportunity, the invitation has been laid and out. How he lays it out. To everyone even those that didn't show up until the 11th hour, he still brings them in and gives them eternal life. And that's very generous. I mean, he could have given them half of eternity, <laughs> which would technically still be eternity, by the way. Right. <laughs> See what I did there? It's a math joke. Uh, all right. So what two points can be learned from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 19? I'll go first. How about that? Yeah. So my first one was, uh, came from my group last night. It was run your own race. Run your own race. Work your own shift was kind of what we finally came down to. Um, uh, I gave you credit for the, the quote that uh, whenever you compare yourself to others, there's only two options, pride and disappointment. That wasn't me. But it was definitely you that told it to me. <laughs> so I don't know where you got it from. But I got it from you. Say it again. When you compare yourself to others, there's oh, yeah. only two options. Oh, yeah. Pride and disappointment. <laughs> there you go. Right? That makes you're sense. either looking at them thinking like you're better than them, and then that you know makes you <laughs> puffed up with pride, or you're looking at them like, why can't I be like that or get that, and then you're disappointed. Right. So your pride, disappointment. Um, wow. The second thing is a quote from T.D. Jakes. I can't remember when I heard him say this. This is, uh, I just remember him kind of, pacing up and down the front of his church, you know, there at the potter's house, you know, with his, his hanky and wiping the sweat off of his brow. And he was saying that favor ain't fair, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think that that is the way that, as you mentioned, kind of in your part of the commentary, or maybe it was you that said it, that the way that God wants us to have an attitude is that we will do anything for him and whatever reward he gives us will be more than enough because he's more than enough. Amen. That's true. That's good. 
That's good. Those are your two. Those are my two. Those, that's pretty deep. I, I, I have, I have two, but I only have one written down. I got to think of my second one. But uh, what did you agree to when you got saved? Hmm. Just something to think about. What did you cry out to the Lord and say? Well, we all said, "I'll follow you. I'll do anything." Right. That's what know? I'm saying. Yeah. Though. So maybe He's holding us to that, even though we can break that vow. Uh, we shouldn't. Even, even though maybe you might be a prodigal son or daughter no longer following him and got you out of a bind. Yeah. And then maybe now all of a sudden the ball's in your court. Now you're like, why, why is my life better than what it could be? Yeah. Because you, you broke a vow. Yeah. But he's going to hang it over your head. Mm-hmm. Not just let you get away with it. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, if you see people that have come into the Hebrew roots and walk away, their life is, has not been good. I haven't seen anybody that was successful that has come into the knowledge of this and walked away. I don't. I see no success. Well, once you've come this far, I don't see how you go back to being like a mainstream Christian. So then you just have to go become a heathen. That's essentially it. I don't. I don't see a another option because you can't go back to the old way, for sure. Because you'll feel disingenuous, and that's that's going to be you know, that's not going to be good. So well, do you have, I, I would like to bring out the second point. Oh, it is time for n- point number two. I have to say this in light of everything, because you, if you get a little confused about the parable and not sure about it, I would like to go to the fact that more than one time it's mentioned, God gives to every man according to his works. Mm. So, like, what are your motives? Why are you doing what you're doing? You know, what's in it for me? What are you doing? You know, like I told the Lord— as long as you provide the tithes and offerings and a salary and, and take care of my family, I can do this, Lord. I can do this work. But you really have to have a storehouse to provide for me and my family. Otherwise, what good am I going to be the work of the Lord and, and, sure. and not be able to pay my electric bill or whatever? So this parable would also give you like the idea that because everybody gets the same thing, then like, does it really matter what I do? Can I just come to the Lord at the end of my life? And there are definitely rewards given to those that give up, right? Things and, and that those that give to the Lord and focus on the kingdom, as has been made clear in the end of chapter 19. Um, and at the end of the day, what's going to happen is the Lord's going to give us crowns and rewards. But then what we end up doing is we end up giving them to Yeshua. We end up throwing them at his feet. And I don't know yeah. what the actual dynamic of that is, but I have one yeah. other imagination. Imagine this. You ready? He says, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. So I'm just imagining that there's like a heavenly savings account up there that I'm, you know, working towards racking up a it's the seven 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 plan a balance on right not the four hundred one k but then like when you get up there what do you get to spend it on that's what I'm wondering like how does this actually work is it Commerce. like Chuck E Cheese where you go to the the prize counter unlimited credit line unlimited unlimited credit line we should line. probably stop there before we start to blaspheme you know uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot to think about, Ryan. You know, I'm I'm 55, been married 23 years. I have eight children, and I've been uh, contemplating and meditating and thinking about life. Yeah. What is life about? The meaning of life? What What am I doing? Where am I at? It always goes back to the vision that, that he showed me about the two houses, Ephraim and Judah, that the Gentiles and the Jews have to come together. Those Gentiles coming out of the nations— have to come back together. Amen. And I want to be a part of that. Sure. I want to teach it, share it, live it, and let God have an opportunity to create an atmosphere and a place for that to happen here. So whoever comes here is going to hear that message. Right. Because that's who we are. That's what we're doing. So we want to draw Ephraim, and then we want to draw Judah. So for those of you that are watching and listening or whatever, viewing, uh, what an incredible revelation that's out there that a lot of people don't even know about. Right. And an opportunity for those of us so, that have it. So I have to reflect on the fact that I still live for that. Amen. The restoration, regather the whole house of Israel. No matter what's going on around me or personally, I just believe that he'll put the two sticks together. You know, uh, Ephraim and Judah will come together and defeat the enemy. Amen. And Judah's the bow and Ephraim's the arrow and Zechariah. But... I think that's that's what I'm really contemplating and looking at now as we move forward to give to the Lord what he's revealed and walk it out and do it. Sure. And put those frustrations and disappointments aside and say, I've got to really be pursuing this vision with the Lord. Yeah. Because he's given it to me 
and Ryan, he takes joy in when we do it. Amen. So how much joy did he have when Shmuel was here sharing on that Monday night? Yep. How much joy did we have to hear what he had to say and receive him? Well, how happy was the Lord? Yeah. You know, and, and having Dr. Buddy Bell come this weekend, fry him following week. That's right. What joy it will be to to hear someone who's been in the helps ministry for 40 years. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, we could all be better helpers and servants and hospitality and everything, you know. Some people are just not good at it. Sure. But we can always work at it, you know. That's what was good about Abraham. He had great hospitality. He had just been circumcised. He's in a lot of pain. They bring this out in the commentary. But he sees the three men, the strangers, and he gives them hospitality. So Sarah is the first cook in the Bible. She prepares it, you know. And then, of course, you know, then Jacob comes along and sells Esau soup. But uh, the thing is, like I said, what does God want? And, and this is a little plug. Uh, I would say it's probably one of the top five books I've ever read, at least. By Michael Heiser? The yeah, what, Dr. What Michael God Heiser, want? What Does God Want? Yeah. So... You know, there's references out there's books that you should read and need to read, and that's definitely one of them. Sure. He wants you. He wants you. He wants me. He wants us. Yeah. And so when we squabble, when we're jealous, when we think we merit something, then we, we just disqualify ourselves. And that's what I don't want to do. I don't want to disqualify myself. I don't, I'm not entitled to anything. Um, I, I do park in the same parking spot, and people honor that. I don't have my name on it, but I, I do feel like, you know, something happens or whatever. I'm not entitled. Get this man a parking spot. Yeah. I'm not entitled to anything, and I just thank God for everything that he's given me. I have no complaints. He's blessed me Amen. immensely. I really have absolutely no complaints, you know. Started to feel a little congested coming out. I just prayed, did some natural things, you know, because we're fragile. We're like yeah. the dew on the grass. And Both my parents have going. COVID right now, by the way. Yeah. Well, wow. Yeah. So you want to close us out in prayer? And I do. Lift them up and anybody I do. else who's not feeling well. I do. I want to bless everybody. Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you, God, that uh, there is a kingdom that we get to participate in, Lord. And whatever wage it is that you have for us, Lord, we just say right now that you are more than generous, that what you've given us already and what you have for us, Lord, is more than enough. And we're just so grateful. We're so thankful, Lord. And so we lift up anybody out there, God, that is uh, struggling this season with cold and flu season, with COVID or, or RSV or whatever illnesses are being listed out there right now, um, especially my parents, uh, Manny and Amber Cabrera, God, that uh, you would lift them up, that you would heal them, uh, make them whole, Lord. And uh, in anyone else, Father, under the sound of my voice, that's not feeling well right now, God, that you would, uh, your spirit would indwell them and there would be a supernatural healing in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So if you guys want to reach out to me, it's ryan at twopraise.net. That's my email. You can also uh, make comments, like, and subscribe on these videos and share them and whatnot. Uh, It really helps us out. So just go ahead and do it. Um, and, uh, And that's it. So bless you guys. Have a great week.